Earlier in the week, we learned he said he was fearful for his life. But the St. Louis Post-Dispatch has new details from a source with knowledge of Officer Wilson's statements. Reportedly, Officer Wilson says Brown instigated the initial struggle in the police car, claiming, quote, Brown slammed its door shut and punched Wilson in the left side of the face through the open window. The report also details what Officer Wilson says occurred after he left the car and pursued Brown. Wilson says Brown stopped and turned around, and Wilson told investigators Brown began running toward him. Wilson said he had yelled for Brown to stop, then fired. Brown flinched as if he were hit, and Wilson said he had stopped shooting. Brown continued running toward him, and Wilson said he had fired several more shots. This is a very key claim. Darren Wilson is saying Michael Brown kept charging at him. But at least eight eyewitnesses dispute that claim. So what does this new account mean for the investigation? And what happens next? Joining me now is former U.S. Attorney Kendall Coffey and trial attorney Seema Iyer. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Rev. Thanks, Reverend. Kendall, what questions do you have about Officer Wilson's account? Well, I think the, the, the clear thing is that he has a very detailed explanation of what happened inside the car, whereas we know there is no living witness that can contradict what he's saying. The critical facts of what happened outside the car, which is where Michael Brown was killed, seem to support a view that there's a contradiction. Does that mean there's no prosecution? Absolutely not. It isn't a matter of whether there are different witnesses with different accounts. It's who's credible, who's got a motive to lie, and who is corroborated by the forensics. Here we've got independent witnesses, spontaneous witnesses, that seem to directly corroborate what Officer Wilson is saying. If prosecute what is saying, if prosecutors are willing to accept that testimony, that it means a couple things. One is the officer could be considered to be lying if they accept the independent witness account. Secondly, his false testimony would be evidence of guilt. But additionally, Reverend, it would indicate that independent wills, uh, witnesses say that whatever happened inside the car, if somebody's trying to surrender outside the car, you can't kill them. And if you do, it's a crime. Seema, what's your take on this? Well, Rev, I have to enlighten you on the ugly truth of being a defense attorney. This is what we do. We have the friend Topsy. He says such self-serving, gratuitous comments, which I think that defendants who are lying say. He says at one point he almost lost consciousness. Well, let me just okay. be frank. Are you saying he might have been coached? He has to be coached. That's our job. He has to be coached by his defense attorney. So let's take, for example, Piaget Crenshaw or Mr. Johnson. They don't have, Rev, the ability to be coached 18 hours a day right. by a team of defense attorneys, okay? And he is he will be coached on even crying to the grand jurors, showing emotion, showing remorse, and then fitting every single detail but, into the narrative. All right, but Kendall, you've been a prosecutor. I mentioned this in the intro. At least eight eyewitnesses have said Michael Brown wasn't charging Officer Wilson. Philip Walker told the Post-Dispatch Brown did not rush the officer. A construction worker who didn't live in the community at all said there was no bull rush. A Piaget Crenshaw said Michael Brown was complying, and so on. Those are very different accounts than what Officer Wilson is saying. Very different and certainly compelling for prosecution if there were a will to bring a prosecution. That's but it. We haven't That's seen right. that. And if, and, and if you put You're a well prepared... You're talking about the, a will by the uh, local district attorney, McCullough, who many of us said in the beginning we didn't have a lot of confidence in. Right. Absolutely. And consider the process. If you put a well-prepared police officer with a well-prepared explanation in front of a grand jury without a well-prepared cross-examination, then you're not going to get nine out of 12 grand jurors to vote to indict. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So it, what Kendall is saying is that if the prosecutor isn't cross-examining Mr. Wilson properly, right. then he's not going to get indicted in a 70 percent white well, county. Well, if, if he, if he uh, uh, didn't want to indict him, then he probably wouldn't. If he did, 
there's certainly when you have eight witnesses saying something different, most of whom didn't know each other, two of which were men that were not even in the community. Uh, they were construction workers, happened to be observing, and uh, not even of the same racial group saying that is things right. that corroborate this, right. then you can proceed. Because, help me out here, because I think, Kendall, a lot of people get confused. A grand jury doesn't try the case. The grand jury says right. there's enough probable cause to go to trial. If you've got eight witnesses that corroborate many key factors against one witness, which is the officer, if you want to proceed, you clearly have enough to proceed if you're the prosecutor. Am I right, Kendall? You're exactly right. It's about probable cause, which does not require a detailed consideration of the defense evidence. Is there enough probable cause to make out a prosecution case? Somehow, as you point out, that's been lost in this process. And that's why the opportunity for prosecution may be being lost in front of the local grand jury. Now, which brings us, Seema, to the federal grand jury, because I think a lot of people understand, many of us have openly said federal right. government should do it again. Let the evidence go where it, it may, but let's have a fair process, not uh, Which Eric, Eric Holder prompted the right. investigation way before any other attorney general exactly. would have gotten involved. Now, what, what, what I'm saying is that, because there's a lot of confusion, well, where does civil rights come in here? You do not need race to have civil rights charges. No, this is an excessive force. Excessive force, force right. is a violation of civil rights. And you could argue, could, that shooting several times after... I agree with that. I agree could with that. Feed, meet a federal standard. That's right, because what happened in the car has to be looked at separate and apart from when Michael Brown ran away. The, the event stopped. A new event starts when Michael Brown runs away. And then the question becomes, was it excessive force for Officer Wilson to shoot at Michael Brown during that second event? Was that excessive force? And that's also the event where you have a lot of witnesses. Don't right? you also, Kendall, have the situation here where if this uh, prosecutor, Mr. McCullough, who many of us have questioned from the beginning, and the family has questioned of Michael Brown from the beginning, don't you really have also the question here of if he does not indict, as many expect, and uh, if he does not go forward, that he's really saying that we in this country can have the possibility of eight people saying something and one policeman can say, no, they're wrong, and we go with that? I mean, isn't that a bad precedent to have in the system, no matter what your view of this case? Well, it certainly would be something that could be troubling for a lot of reasons. But I want to get back to the point just made. When we talk about a civil rights violation, it doesn't mean you have to prove a hate crime. What it means is you have to show excessive force, lethal force, with a sufficient degree of intentionality. And if an officer killed somebody that in plain day, visually clear, was trying to surrender, that sounds like a pretty good case for intentional use of excessive force. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Certainly a lot of questions. Certainly we'll be staying on top of this. And again, many of us only want to see a fair impartial investigation and let the evidence lead where it may, but not see it in any way tainted by politics. Kendall Coffey and Seema Dyer, thank you for your time tonight. Thanks, Rev. Coming Thanks, up. Reverend.